Thanks very much, and thank you for the kind invitation. Uh, and thanks to Mandy for inviting me here and organizing all the logistics. And thank you all for, for making it this evening. Um, so, uh, so I'm going to spend the next, I guess, kind of 45 minutes. Uh, if you get bored, I'll cut it to you know, 30 minutes. Uh, discussing some of the main arguments in this in the new book that I have to write. Uh, the, the book is coming out with the University of California Press, and it's titled The Development Delusion, uh, How the Aid Industry Hides the True Causes of Poverty. Um, so I, I've, I've kind of changed the title because I didn't want to make anybody angry, because <laughs> uh, it's a bit of a harder uh, title. Um, but effectively, in, in the time I have here, I'm going to argue first that despite 65 years of efforts, the development industry is, is very clearly failing to, uh, to reduce global uh, global poverty, despite its claims to the contrary. So I'm going to examine those claims and critique them. And second, I'll argue that the reason the development industry is failing uh, is because it refuses to address the root causes of, of poverty. So it, see, it tends to see poverty and underdevelopment as endogenous problems having to do with domestic policies, um, and effectively ignores the external political forces that are much more causally significant when it comes to this problem. Uh, so uh, we can draw parallels to uh, to thinking of uh, Palestine as, or the West Bank as an, as an enclave within a broader system that, uh, that, that constrains the possibilities for development in various political ways. Um, and that's kind of the, the point I want to push towards. Um, as opposed to seeing Palestine sort of endogenously underdeveloped. Right? So, so third, I'll argue that in order to be effective, our solutions uh, to poverty have to address the fundamental power imbalances in the global economy. And I'll offer some thoughts about what this might look like. So, okay, so as you probably know, for those of you who kind of track the development news, last year the UN published the final reports of the MDGs, the, the Millennium Development Goals. Um, everyone's kind of aware of, of that whole system. So, it, so the, 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 um, the report leads with like a glowing good news narrative about how the, the world is getting really dramatically better. Not perfect, but better. Uh, and it claims that the MDGs succeeded in cutting uh, poverty uh, rates in half and hunger rates nearly in half. So forgive the slides, I had to kind of um, cut and paste here. Uh, let's see here. Um, so I don't have all the slides, sadly. Um, we had a bit of a technological mishap. But I'll quote to you. So effectively, they, they, they say that po the poverty rates have been, have been cut in half and are now just under about 1 billion people worldwide. And the hunger rates have been cut nearly in half and are now just about 795, 800 um, uh, million people worldwide. Okay. Um, so these claims have been uh, endlessly repeated by the media. I'm sure you've heard them before. Uh, and it's an incredibly powerful story. So it's not just plain old stats, it's a very powerful political tool. So for those who have an interest in defending the status quo of the global economic system, these stats are, um, are very welcome. Uh, they sort of lend a kind of moral, a moral justification to the present order of the global economy, and they sort of tell us that wh whatever we're doing now is basically okay, and we should continue doing it, it's, it's working. Uh, and sometimes this argument is, is really quite explicit. This is um, an excerpt from, uh, from The Spectator, um, so it says, we are right now living through the golden age of poverty reduction. Anyone serious about tackling global poverty has to accept that whatever we're doing now, it's working. So we should keep doing it. We're on the road to an incredible goal, the abolition of poverty as we know it, within our lifetime. Those who care more about helping the poor than hurting the rich will celebrate this fact and urge leaders to make sure that free trade and global capitalism keep spreading. It's the only true way to make poverty history. So you get a sense for how this, this narrative of poverty reduction gets co-opted for political purposes. Um, interestingly, what the spectator is talking about here, it's in response to those new, the new Oxfam stats that came out last year, saying that for the first time in history, the richest 1% of the world's population uh, had more wealth than the rest of the world's population combined. Right? Uh, and so the spectator came out saying, well, you know, it may be true that the, world's one, one, the richest 1% um, are hoarding immense amount, unthinkable amounts of wealth, uh, but that's okay. It's effectively justified because, look, you know, the system we have that's giving them such wealth is also simultaneously reducing poverty really dramatically. So it's fine, don't worry too much about inequality. Um, so, but myself and a number of other scholars have been pointing out that this good news narrative actually isn't accurate. Okay? Uh, and I won't go into a lot, a lot of detail here because it gets a bit boring and sort of econometrics uh, But the basic point is that the UN has effectively manipulated the data to make it seem as though poverty and hunger are being reduced, when in fact, they're not. Okay, so the, a, a couple of key things here. The, the first key thing to understand is that the original goal that was agreed by governments um, when, it came, when, it come to, when it came to cutting poverty and hunger rates and ha uh, hunger in half uh, dealt with absolute numbers to reduce the absolute number of people suffering extreme poverty and, and extreme hunger. But they changed this goal three times. First, they shifted to having not absolute numbers, but having proportions. Okay? Um, and then, uh, of course, this made the goal much easier to achieve because you, you have the benefit of uh, an ever-growing, faster-growing denominator. 
Uh, and then second, they, they, they shifted from halving the proportion of poor and hungry people in the whole world to halving the proportion in only developing countries. Okay, so this allowed them to take advantage of an even faster growing denominator than before. So very, very powerful statistical manipulation uh, that literally nobody was reporting on except for a few scholars. And then third, they moved the baseline from, two, from 2000 back to 1990. This gave them much more time to accomplish their goal of reducing proportions, and also allowed them to retroactively claim gains that were made by China during the 1990s, um, even though they had nothing at all to do with the MDGs, and indeed happened before the MDGs were even uh, invented. Okay, and again, the scandal here is that journalists didn't report any of this uh, manipulation of the of the parameters of this data. Um, so, but by redefining the goals, the UN has created a very powerful impression that poverty and hunger. Uh, have been reduced when in fact um, it's not true. So what would a more accurate story of poverty look like? Well, if we go with absolute numbers, and if we take China out of the equation, just for the sake of argument, we see that the global poverty headcount is exactly the same today as it was in 1981, when they started measuring. So we're looking at this line here. This blue line is the one that the UN uses to, uh, to, to bolster their poverty reduction narrative. This yellow line is, is taking China out of the equation. Okay. That's at $1.25 per day. So I hope that slide is basically clear. Um, right, so in other words, uh, the, the MDGs lead us to believe that poverty has been decreasing around the world, but in fact, the only place this holds true effectively in aggregate <coughs> is in China and East Asia, which are also the only economies that were not forcibly liberated, uh, li liberalized by the World Bank and the IMF. So everywhere else, besides those two regions, poverty has been stagnant or getting worse in aggregate. Okay. So, but in reality, the picture is actually even worse than this. And so the, the other problem that we need to address is uh, the fact that the UN data relies on, uh, on a poverty line of $1.25 per day. Right? So this sounds fine to us because we're used to hearing it. After all, this is the standard international poverty line that the World Bank uses. It seems to have a lot of authority. Um, but in fact, there's a very strong scholarly consensus in the literature that this is far too low. So according to a number of, uh, of important studies, in order to meet even the most basic minimum standards for nutrition, uh, infant mortality, and human life expectancy, people need about four times more than the international poverty line, or about $5 per day. This is what researchers call the ethical poverty line. So, and, and in fact, even the World Bank admits that this is true, okay? that this line is more accurate, the $5 a day line. So what happens if we measure poverty at the ethical poverty line? We see that the global poverty headcount is not 1 billion people, as the UN claims, but rather closer to 4.2 billion people. That's the green line up here. All right? uh, and again, th this is according to the World Bank's own calculations. This data comes from the World Bank. Um, so that's more than 60% of the world's population. And what's, what's also very important here is the numbers have been rising steadily since 1980, not falling. Right? So, so, so a number of us have been demanding that the UN use a more accurate poverty line, but they've consistently refused. They insist on, conti on continuing to use the discredited dollar a day figure. And the reason is because that's, that this is literally the only poverty line that shows any progress against poverty at all. Every other line tells effectively the opposite story. Um, so there's a very similar story to be told here about the, about the hunger figures that the UN uses. And this is also a really, to me, a fascinating story. Uh, so for most of the MDG period, for those of you who are paying attention, um, uh, the UN was announcing that hunger was rising. Okay, uh, maybe you remember that. And the goal—they explicitly admitted the goal would be impossible to achieve. Uh, it was set to be a complete failure. But then, right before the end of the MDGs, uh, uh, three years before, they began telling the exact opposite story, just in time to claim for the MDGs to claim success. So, so how did they do that? How did they go from stats that showed a rising trend and suddenly the next year showing a falling trend? Uh, so one of the ways they did this was by pushing the calorie threshold by which they measured hunger to lower levels. What this did is it made it seem statistically as though fewer people were, hu were hungry when in fact nothing had changed in the real world. Um, and this is bad, of course, because uh, the UN's uh, um, hunger threshold for calories was, uh, was already extremely conservative. So let me give you a sense for what the UN's definition of hunger is. So the UN counts people as hungry only when their calorie intake becomes, quote, inadequate to cover minimum needs for a sedentary lifestyle for over a year. Okay. What this means is that if you're hungry for 11 months in a row, the UN does not count you as hungry. You have to be hungry for a full 12 months. And of course, uh, and, and, and it talks about sedentary lifestyles. So of course, um, most poor people do not live sedentary lifestyles. Rather, they're engaged in demanding physical labor. So in reality, they need, they need much more than the UN's calorie threshold. 
Um, and another key issue is that the UN's uh, measure does not, which comes from the FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization, does not count uh, nutrient deficiency. Uh, it only counts calories. So people who suffer from, from, uh, malnutri from malnutrition of uh, nutrients um, uh, completely fall through the cracks. And the UN itself admits these flaws. Okay, so it's not like this is news to them. It's just that if they measured it more accurately, they would have a different story on their hands that would be very politically unfeasible for them. So scholars are now insisting that the hunger numbers are probably uh, in the region of two to three times higher than the UN uh, would have us believe, as high as two billion people in the world. Um, and the numbers are rising. So, so look at this slide. This slide actually comes from the, the FAO. Um, it appeared in one, in, in, in one of their reports. Now this is the, this is the line that the, U, the UN uses, which is for it measures calories required for minimal physical activity. And this is the one they're using to say that poverty has been reducing, although, although very, not very much, um, uh, you know, down to about uh, 800 million people. This is the line for normal activity, and this is the line for, hot, for intense activity. And scholars are suggesting that probably the hunger, the, the reality of hunger in the world is probably somewhere between these, so in the region of two, uh, two billion people. Um, and this is only calories, so if you count micronutrient deficiency, it would probably be even higher. Um, and, if you, and also, if you count the food price crisis, which the UN does not count, we would see a very uh, sharp uptick towards the end of this period. Okay, so the implications of this reality, I think, are profound. The fact that poverty and hunger trends have been worsening means that business, uh, the business as usual model of, de of development is clearly not working and calls, uh, as far as I as far as the very legitimacy of the global economy into question. Uh, basically, it appears that the system is effectively failing the majority of humanity. It also means that if the problem is as bad as these numbers suggest, then, then we can't go about fixing it with just a, a bit of aid here and there, tweaking the system around the edges. It will require a kind of fundamental reorganization of the global economy to make it fairer for the world's majority in the first place. Um, which, which I think is one of the reasons why uh, the UN and the World Bank, et cetera, avoid these more accurate numbers. Because of what it would imply. So I also want to say just a few things about inequality really briefly. So you all know, again, this famous Oxfam stat that went viral, the richest 1% have more wealth than the rest of the world's population combined. But actually, uh, this is a very conservative estimate. Um, so given that the rich, you know, as we know, they hide much of their wealth in, um, in tax havens and secrecy, uh, secrecy jurisdictions, um, as the Panama Papers have revealed to us. So it's actually impossible to know how much wealth they really have. Um, so recent estimates suggest that around 32 trillion US dollars is hidden abroad in tax havens. Um, so that's around one-sixth of the world's total private wealth. This is an enormous amount of money. Um, so if we were to add that money to, uh, to the, in the inequality metrics in, in the 1% in the, in the column, what we, see, what, we, what we would see is that um, the situation when it comes to inequality would look much, much worse, dramatically worse. Um, so, but some might say, yes, uh, it, it may be true that inequality among individuals in this wealth sense is getting worse. But at least the gap between poor countries and rich countries is narrowing, right? Um, and this is a very common opinion. Uh, and indeed, it seems to be almost self-evidently true. So if you think about all the discourse around the, the rapid rise of China um, and Africa, et cetera, kind of catching up to the West as the way it's framed. But unfortunately, the, the reality is not the case. Um, in fact, history shows exactly the opposite. Um, inequality between countries has, not, has been increasing by orders of magnitude uh, and shows no signs of slowing. So the most common way to think about global inequality in this sense is to measure the gap between the richest and the poorest countries uh, in real income per capita. So let's take a look at this. Um, right, so uh, per capita income, richest country versus the poorest country. So um, in 1800, during early uh, imperial period, what we see is the richest country was six times richer than the poorest country. In, in 1960, the end of colonialism, we see that the richest country was 33 times richer than the poorest country, which is a, a substantial gap, right? Then in 2000, at the height of the neoliberal period, we see that the richest country was 134 times richer than the poorest country. So again, these are orders of magnitude uh, um, increases. It's dramatic. So it's not, it's not convergence, it's in fact divergence in a, in a kind of a rapid way. Um, so of course, one might object that that earlier metric overstates inequality by focusing on countries either extreme, the poorest and the richest. <laughs> so we can correct for that by looking at, uh, at inequalities regionally. And here what I've done is I've plotted um, real income, uh, real GDP per capita for the US, the, co the dominant core power uh, in the world, uh, versus uh, various global south regions. So here we have Latin America, here we have uh, the Middle East and North Africa, here we have South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, and so this gives you a visual sense for the size of the gap that's emerging, and this is only since 1960 
This has nothing to do with the colonial period, uh, the legacy of colonialism maybe, but very clearly, uh, in the era of developments, this is what we're seeing. Um, hard, hardly any, in fact, any meaningful increase at all in GDP per capita for the global south, and particularly in comparison to the US. So, so as I see it, this represents a failure of, developing, of, of the development industry in, in no uncertain terms. Um, so the question becomes, why is development failing so dramatically? So the reason, uh, the reason it's failing is because it fundamentally misses the point about poverty, and this is the argument I want to make to you. It assumes, again, that poverty is an endogenous problem um, having to do with internal domestic conditions or, or policies, as if, as if poor countries are somehow cut off from the rich world, uh, disconnected from the rest of the world, as if their poverty has nothing to do with external political forces. So this is, as I see it, kind of the, the classic view of individual responsibility mapped onto the nation state. You're poor because you're lazy or whatever it may be, mapped onto the nation state, right? So this view, of course, has some merit. There's no question that endogenous policies have something to do with it. But the fundamental problem is that it ignores the long history of imperialism that constructed a world system that remains effectively rigged in the interests of a, a, a relatively small number of rich countries. So in, in my book, the key thing that I deal with here is, um, is the development of these, uh, une the use of these unequal treaties during colonialism, which effectively allowed rich uh, uh, colonizing countries to keep their tariffs high, but force down trade tariffs in, uh, in the colonies. And what this meant was that uh, it effectively prevented industrialization in the colonies and allowed uh, European manufacturers to, uh, to find an outlet for their products. Um, so, okay, right, but colonialism is over, of course, uh, so surely we can no longer blame rich countries for the failure of developments in the global south. Well, it's true that things did begin to change after colonialism, and here I have in mind, in the 1950s, and 1960s, and 70s, uh, newly independent global south countries followed kind of the Keynesian model of development um, that had worked so well in the West uh, during the post-war decades. They made strategic use of land reforms to help peasant farmers, uh, labor laws to boost workers' wages, uh, tariffs to protect local businesses, and resource nationalization to, uh, to fund things like public housing and health care and education. And these, these progressive policies were very successful. They, they maintained uh, high per capita income rates, um, income growth rates of about 3.2% during the, these two or three decades, okay, which is pretty dramatic, uh, much, higher than, um, much higher than under colonialism. Okay. Uh, so this was kind of a development miracle during this period. But unfortunately, uh, this miracle was very short-lived. Okay? So this period of real independence for global South countries only lasted for a couple of decades after the end of colonialism. It all began to change in 1980 during the, uh, the Third World Debt Crisis. Um, how many of you are aware of, kind of how that history works with the, the Third World Debt Crisis? A few people. So basically... Um, just to give kind of a very brief and simple history of this, it started with the U.S. dramatically raising interest rates um, in, in about 1980, 1981, uh, and this was called the Volcker Shock. Um, and, and, and what happened was that developing countries had their debt denominated in U.S. dollars, and so suddenly the interest rates on their debt skyrocketed. Okay? Mm -hmm. it, it became clear that they were unable to, pay, to repay the debt uh, to Wall Street banks, um, and so their, their, uh, their economies came to the, to the brink of default. Um, now, now, technically, they should have been allowed to default because the loans had been made in very, under, under very risky conditions in the first place. But, uh, but Wall Street insisted, you know, if, 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 you do, if, if we let third world countries default on their debt, then, uh, then Wall Street banks will collapse. And as a result, the entire financial architecture will also collapse. So this should sound familiar to you from the, the 2008 crisis. Um, and as a result, the U.S. government stepped in to force third world, uh, third world countries to repay their debts to Wall Street banks. Um, and the way they did this was by uh, bringing in the IMF to roll over the debts on the condition that they would adopt basically austerity um, uh, programs. They're called structural adjustment programs. Uh, and this was, um, this was mandatory for the, the vast majority of the global south. Now, so, so structural adjustment programs, I'm sure some of you have heard of them, but they entailed basically forced privatization of public assets. They entailed forced trade liberalization. And they, uh, they entailed um, austerity, so, so massive cuts to social spending. The idea was that all of the money saved from social spending, um, uh, et cetera, would be, would be funneled directly to the creditor. So it was a way of guaranteeing uh, debt repayment um, by taking money away from public coffers, by appropriating already existing resources in third world countries. Okay. So uh, again, you know, I think that the, the Greece situation is exactly the same thing. It's a structural adjustment program being imposed on Greece 
forcing it to repay creditors at the expense of the poor in the country. We're, you know, we're seeing this austerity program cause massive poverty in Greece. Um, right, so the, the World Bank and the IMF assured us that structural adjustment would help stimulate the economies of poor countries. But in fact, exactly the opposite happened. Instead of helping poor countries uh, grow, structural adjustment basically destroyed them. So take a look at this slide here. Hopefully it works, yes. Uh, so, so per capita income growth in, developing, in the developing world was cut dramatically from 3.2% to 0.7%. So here we have uh, OECD economies during the post-colonial period, 3.5% growth. During the structural adjustment period, 2% growth, so a decline. Uh, global South economies, 3.2% growth to 0.7% growth. This is basically crisis. I mean, this, is, this just shows like uh, the destruction of global South economies is what this shows. Um, not only that, but the differential between the two was 0.3% for, for the post-colonial period. So basically growing at roughly the same rate. And here we see a much larger differential of 1.3%. What that means is that this is what stirred inequality to, uh, to such great heights. So you see stagnation, but also uh, rising inequality. Does that make sense to everybody so far? Um, okay, so, so structural adjustment was particularly uh, destructive in sub-Saharan Africa, where, where it didn't just stagnate economies. GMPs, uh, the gross national product of, of sub-Saharan Africa, actually shrank by 10% during this period, and the number of people in absolute poverty doubled. Okay, so just to give you a sense of what this looked like. So this is Kenya. This is income per capita in Kenya. So what we see is, is rising well during the post-colonial, immediate post-colonial period. And then we see a structural adjustment program imposed, and we see stagnation in incomes. This blue line is what uh, economists projected uh, income would look like in Kenya by 2000, and this is what it actually was. Okay, so you really see a gap, effectively a de-development of Kenya. Um, okay. this, is, uh, this is all of Latin America together. We see the same trends. Post-colonial period, uh, rising, and then massive uh, fall-off during structural adjustment, stagnation. This is what it would have been if it had continued. Uh, I'm, I'm missing some slides, sadly. So that's OK, because they're kind of boring anyways. But, uh, but this slide, I'm just going to go back to this slide here. So, so what we see is during the structural adjustment period from 1980 to 2000, this is where we see a dramatic increase in the, the number of poor around the world, okay? an increase of, uh, of about 1.1, 1.2 billion people. Okay? So it's pretty, it's pretty dramatic. So scholars are basically in agreement that the structural adjustment period uh, these programs were the greatest single cause of poverty in the 20th century after colonialism, okay? Uh, so, and ironically, uh, structural adjustment was conducted under the banner of development. This is the real legacy of development, as far as uh, I'm concerned. So, so, so uh, you know, how could this have happened, uh, given the fact that the World Bank and IMF had this data showing how destructive their policies were, were being? Why would they continue with these, with these policies? Um, and of course, the, re the reason is that the World Bank and IMF are deeply anti-democratic organizations. Right? They're, they're controlled predominantly by a small handful of, of rich countries. And the US enjoys veto power over all um, major decisions. So the Global South, which has 80% of the world's population, has less than 50% of the vote in the World Bank and IMF. And these are the major structures of, of global economic governance, okay? uh, completely undemocratic. Um, so, and then of course another big issue is that the World Bank and IMF enjoy sovereign immunity status, which effectively means that if you're, uh, if you're in a poor country, um, or if you are a poor country, and you were uh, ruined by structural investment, um, there's no way that you can claim compensation or can sue the World Bank and IMF. You can try, they could just say, uh, you know, we have sovereign immunity, and this has been tried before and it failed. And what this means is they operate basically with impunity. There's no accountability for their policies when they cause massive economic crisis or human devastation. So another major issue, of course, is, oh, I should just say. So um, in case you think that structural adjustment is over, in fact, it's not. It's being continued uh, today in the form of what they call poverty reduction strategy papers, which sounds a lot nicer. <laughs> poverty reduction strategy papers actually um, allow, allow us, uh, more social spending, which is why we see some slacking off in, in the poverty, in the rate of poverty increase uh, during this period. But they're equally, they're equally um, uh, neoliberal in the sense of forcing trade liberalization uh, uh, and privatization. Okay. So another another major problem in terms of in terms of thinking about. Oh, I, I mean, I, I should say like the um, the important point here is that uh, the the development industry effectively ignores these major drivers of poverty. I mean, you you literally almost never hear um, any major player in the development industry 
talking about structural adjustment as a cause of poverty. This is ignored. Uh, so, and so the, you know, this rise in poverty is considered an endogenous problem, when in fact we know for a fact uh, that, it's, uh, that it was ex exogenously induced. Um, and there are other forms of important uh, sort of political drivers of global poverty we, we'd have to keep in mind. Like um, in the WTO, as we know, bargaining power is, uh, is determined by market size. And this means that Western powers uh, hold almost all the bargaining chips. Um, and this explains why, why agricultural subsidies are disallowed for developing countries, but allowed for the EU and the US, okay? uh, which is a massive inequality um, and a major reason for continuing poverty in the development. Uh, and also explains, okay, so I'm, I'm from the small country of Swaziland, uh, and, um, and Swaziland has, has the highest AIDS burden in the world. And during the 1980s, um, you know, we, there were drugs available, in the 1990s there were drugs available to cure, uh, sorry, not to cure, but to, to prevent um, uh, the symptoms of AIDS, right? Um, Antiretroviral drugs. Uh, they, were available, they were available generically from India for a very low cost, um, but because of WTO rules, uh, patent laws, um, uh, we were unable to import them into Swaziland, and we had to buy them directly from, from the patent holders at uh, an extortionate cost of something like fifteen, twenty thousand dollars per uh, per yearly course, which of course is way, way too expensive for anyone in Swaziland to afford. And so the, the massive uh, debt, um, uh, AIDS burden in Swaziland, and the deaths that this caused, uh, had everything to do with the patent laws imposed by the WTO. Uh, it's often, you know, it, it, it's often the case that the development agencies in Swaziland blame Swazis themselves for pathological sexuality or whatever it might be um, as, as the key driving force of the HIV epi epidemic. But in fact, the real issue here is the fact that we were effectively denied access to life-saving drugs. Um, so the point I'm trying to make here is that it, 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 uh, it makes very little sense, actually, to focus on improving national conditions for poverty eradication when the most significant drivers of poverty have to do with the structure of the global political economy. So this seems like a really simple point. Maybe some of you already know it. Uh, but the development industry does an incredibly effective job at ignoring it, at avoiding it. So instead of thinking about these root causes, um, the industry distracts us with the, the narrative of aid. Okay? And this is the next step that I want to take. According to the, to, to the aid narrative, uh, rich countries bear no responsibility for the poverty of poor countries. Quite the contrary. They reach out across the chasm right? and they give generously of their surplus. Now, how this surplus uh, was acquired is never questioned. Um, and the claim made by figures like Jeffrey Sachs, very popular in the aid industry, is that if rich countries give just enough aid, they'll be able to help, poor, uh, help sort of boost poor countries up the development ladder. But of course, in most cases, uh, it's not that poor countries can't, uh, can't climb the development ladder of their own accord. It's that they are actively prevented from doing so. Okay? Um, but the discourse of aid trumps all of this. Um, after all, it's hard to argue with the blunt fact that rich countries give about $100 billion in foreign aid every year to poor countries. That seems like a massive amount of money. Uh, but in reality, it is vastly outstripped by the wealth that flows in the opposite direction, okay, from poor countries to rich countries. And this is the point I want to make next. I'm glad this one showed up. So. <laughs> so rich countries give about 100 billion dollars per year in aid to poor countries, but these are some of the these are some of the structural losses um, and outflows that, that we can tabulate. Um, and this is just a very quick rundown of what some of these are. So so poor countries then lose 60 billion dollars per year in extra patent licensing fees. What, what I was just talking about, due to the trips agreements on intellectual property rights in WTO. 138 billion dollars per year in tax holidays extracted by multinational corporations. $480 billion per year in lost potential GDP due to structural adjustment, like okay, during the 80s and 90s. $571 billion per year lost in costs associated with climate change. Okay. Um, $700 billion per year in, uh, in export revenue losses due to the Uruguay round and the WTO, um, which, uh, which uh, hobbled the Global South countries' ability to export. Um, a loss of $732 billion per year in debt service, basically a flow of money from poor countries to rich countries. Um, of course, that includes principal payments. Uh, $879 billion per year in trade misinvoicing. This is a form of tax dodging, one of the things that's being attacked now with the revelation of the Panama Papers. $1.09 trillion per year in other illicit fin financial outflows. Okay? This is tabulated by the organization Global Financial Integrity. Um, this is another form of tax dodging. And then $2.66 trillion per year in artificially cheap labor, what economists call unequal exchange. So as a result of 
of globalization, what we see is that corporations are able to force countries to compete to reduce their labor costs and labor regulations. And as a result, what we're seeing is that, uh, is that effectively labor is becoming cheaper than it's actually worth okay? uh, for um, equivalence productivity. So uh, you can't see this at all, but this is just my way of kind of visually representing some of these structural losses and outflows. This is the A budget here in comparison to just some of the ones that I just tabulated here. Um, so, and these are just a few of the losses and outflows that we might tabulate. Of course, we could include, uh, we could include uh, foreign direct investment, but even that would be dwarfed by something like uh, by the losses in the structural adjustment. It's only around, around 400 billion, I think, per year. Um, I don't have those figures with me though. Uh, so if we, tally, if we tally up just these figures, just for the sake of comparison, okay, we get about $7.3 trillion in losses per year <coughs> in global South countries. So compare that to the flow of aid of about 100 billion. <coughs> so what, what this means is that uh, these costs and outflows outstrip the aid budget by about 73 times to one, right? So and again, these figures are not directly comparable, of course, but, but putting them side by side like this does highlight the fact that the aid budget is vastly outstrips by wealth flowing in the other direction, okay? And again, we can quibble with these numbers if we want. Maybe they're a little bit higher, maybe they're a little bit lower. But what remains abundantly clear is that the whole discourse of development has it effectively backwards. Um, so rich countries aren't developing poor countries, poor countries are, uh, are developing rich countries. And aid, um, the discourse of aid masks this harsh reality. It, it makes the takers seem like givers and gives them a kind of moral high ground, okay? So, um, What's my time situation like? Okay, well, you have 10 minutes. Ten minutes, okay. I'll keep doing that then. So I'll just skip through some of these, these thoughts here. Um, so, so what might we propose as solutions to these main structural drivers of poverty? I mean, if we, if we start thinking about poverty as caused by these structural drivers, suddenly the way we think about solutions changes too, right? And I mean, they're kind of obvious from what, I was just, what I've just been talking about. The most important step would be like abolishing the debt burdens of developing countries. Uh, which is really key to rolling back the power that rich countries uh, um, uh, have over them in terms of their macroeconomic policy decision-making space. Okay? Uh, it would help free developing countries to, to devote their budgets to healthcare and education and poverty reduction instead of just handing it over in, uh, in debt service to big banks. Um, we might also say that all development aid should be given without structural adjustment conditions, right? so that countries, can, again, can control their own economic policy decisions as opposed to having them dictated by Washington. Um, uh, you know, we could democratize the World Bank and the IMF uh, to guarantee that the world's majority has fair representation in global governance decisions. Um, the veto power of the US should be abolished. Sovereign immunity status should be abolished. We can think about different kinds of fixes like that. These are the kinds of things that the development industry should be focusing on if they're serious about, about fixing this problem. Um, proposals for making the trade system fair, you know, thinking about how, uh, how to allow poor countries to use subsidies and tariffs for the sake of development as opposed to denying them those tools. Um, you know, th there's, there's interesting policies about how to put a floor on the race to the bottom for cheap wages to make sure that, uh, that, that workers get fair compensation throughout the global south. Something like a global minimum wage has, has been discussed by economists and there are very robust proposals out there uh, for, for that. Um, and we can talk about that in the question and answer if you want. Um, clearly, the need, the need to put an end to tax evasion is essential, and that's, again, becoming an issue right now. Um, also, a number of robust proposals on that front. Um, uh, something like climate reparations, given, given the size of, of damages due to climate change, would be obviously essential, and that should not come from the aid budget, uh, because, again, uh, climate change has been caused primarily by rich countries um, through a long history of industrialization through fossil fuels. Uh, but, of course, the impact is felt on, on poor countries. And of course, most importantly, I would say, we, we need to start using more accurate measures of poverty and hunger so that we know uh, more accurately uh, how, how serious the problem is that we're trying to deal with. And of course, this would, this would focus our, our minds uh, into really thinking about uh, the, the structural causes that are causing such an enormous issue. Okay? Uh, and you know, we think of many more solutions um, along these lines. Uh, the important thing is that by targeting root causes, these interventions would have a monumental, a monumental impact on poverty reduction across the global south, and it, it would not require a single additional dollar in foreign aid, uh, right? It would, however, require a kind of political struggle of some sort, because these changes would run uh, directly straight up against the interests of very powerful actors in the global economic system who extract enormous materi material benefit from the existing rules, okay? So, um, 
in my last like five minutes, I just want to briefly talk kind of informally about the SDGs. I'm sure that, I mean, if this is something interesting, um, I'm sure that this is on your horizon at least a little bit. So, so the question is, what, you know, what about the SDGs? Do they fix any of these problems? Um, they certainly appear to have better rhetoric in the MDGs, et cetera. So the SDGs came into effect last year, and they set out to eradicate poverty by 2030. It all sounds very promising, but unfortunately, the SDGs failed to address almost all of the known structural drivers of global poverty that I've just discussed. They say nothing about fair trade rules. They say nothing about democratizing the World Bank and the IMF. They say nothing about food speculation and land grabs. They say nothing about wage regulations or debt cancellation. I mean, some of these things are mentioned, but the proposals are uh, minimal to uh, pathetic, I would say. And they say almost nothing about tax evasion as well. And as for measurements, they're, same to, they're set to use the exact same discredited measures of poverty and hunger that the MDGs use, uh, which we've been arguing is a serious problem. So, so what exactly is the SDGs plan for eradicating poverty if they're not going to address these structural issues? So if you look at the text, uh, then it mostly boils down to one main thing, um, and that is GDP growth. Okay. So, and this appears mostly in goal eight, uh, right at the very center of the SDGs. And goal eight calls for 7% uh, annual GDP growth in the least developed countries and higher levels of economic growth across the board. So goal eight, and the, and the entirety of the SDGs really, is uh, it's, it's kind of an ode to the promises of growth, right? And of course, this sounds fine on the face of it, as it seems to align with our usual assumptions. Uh, you know, we, we all think that GDP growth is an important way to eradicate poverty. But there are very, a couple of very serious problems we have to consider about this narrative. First, uh, growth just doesn't make any sense as a poverty reduction strategy. Okay? We have to face up to these facts. Uh, the relationship between GDP growth and poverty reduction is highly tenuous. Um, in fact, there's no direct correlation between the two whatsoever. It all depends, of course, on how the growth is distributed. Uh, so even during the most equitable period of growth over the past few decades, the poorest 60% of humanity received only 5% of all new income generated by global growth. 5% went to the poorest 60%. The richest 1% received 90% of the of income gains. Okay, so it gives you a sense for how dramatically skewed the distribution of income is from growth. So this is troubling because given these ratios, it will take approximately 207 years to eliminate poverty at $5 a day. And to get there, we have to grow the global economy by 175 times its present size. I mean, the, the, that, so that's 175 times more extraction and production and consumption than we're, all, than we're already doing uh, in aggregate. So the math on this, I'm sure you'll agree, is completely absurd. Um, even if such immense growth were possible, I mean, think about the footprints that this would require for us to, to grow our global economy by 175 times. Even if that was physically possible, it would uh, drive climate change to such catastrophic levels that it would immediately, rapidly reverse any gains against poverty, right? So there's a clear double bind here. But there's also another reason to worry about the growth strategy. Um, so according to the Global Footprint Network database, I don't know if you guys are aware of this, it's an amazing database to check out. Uh, right now, global production and consumption levels are overshooting our planet's biocapacity uh, by about 50% per year. Um, and again, this should be a familiar story. I mean, this is all over the news these days, uh, biological or uh, ecological overshoot. And the hard truth is that almost all of this overshoot is due to overconsumption in rich countries, a relatively small number of rich countries. So in other words, aggregate global growth is not an option anymore, uh, at least not an option if we want to avoid the collapse of human habitation, uh, of human habitat on this planet. So if aggregate growth doesn't provide a solution to poverty, then the only real alternative is to reduce the enormous inequality that marks our global society. And this gets me back to uh, the inequality stats. So confront, this is an important point, I think. So confronting inequality is, is the only way to end poverty in a climate and resource constrained world. So it, it means not just ratcheting up the poor to higher levels, but simultaneously ratcheting down uh, the overconsumption uh, of rich nations and rich individuals um, in order to create ecological space for poor countries to achieve poverty eradication. Okay. So this means, in effect, shrinking the material economies of overdeveloped countries. And by overdeveloped, I mean uh, uh, countries that consume way more than is necessary for them to achieve high levels of human development. Okay. So, um, so the only real, uh, there's, there's, there's kind of a, a growing academic movement um, along these lines, and it's called the degrowth movement. I'm not sure if you've heard of this before. But it's, uh, it's probably the most rapidly growing academic movement that I've come across in my career. 
Um, a few years ago, it had only you know, uh, a few dozen people that went to the annual conference, and now it's three, 4,000 people attend this conference. It's amazing in Europe. Um, so, uh, but unfortunately, the development industry, of course, uh, has refused to embrace this concept because it's so fundamentally against their assumption that growth equals progress, the, G the GDP growth equals progress equals poverty eradication. Okay? They're so committed to that. So the real challenge of the 21st century, as far as I see, is to figure out how to maximize human development indicators while bringing our, eco our collective ecological footprints and national footprints back within sustainable levels. And this is not an impossible task. Uh, so there are a number of countries out there that have achieved very high human development indicators with relatively low income and consumption rates. Um, so uh, there's lots of, of examples like Costa Rica, uh, Jordan, Tunisia, Ecuador, Nicaragua, Sri Lanka, um, etc. Uh, and, then, and then probably the most, uh, the most impressive of these is Cuba, which has very high human development uh, indicators uh, with only one eighth of the income of the US and it's uh, and a sustainable goal for growth. It's actually less than biocapacity. Um, oh gosh, there's so much I didn't cover. We won't do that. But oh, this is actually, I can show you this slide. This is actually kind of interesting. This slide, I remember I was talking about wealth flowing from poor countries to rich countries. Just briefly want to show you this slide. This slide is, uh, is the sum narrow net resource transfers to Africa between 1980 and 2009. Uh, all resource transfers back and forth. What we see is, is, is pretty much negative the entire way, right? This is, um, illegal and illegal financial flows, investment businesses, debt forgiveness, natural resource exports, everything. What we see is that Africa is a net creditor to the rest of the world. Uh, and the same can be said of most of the global South regions. That's the end of my parenthesis. Let me just go back to this. Uh, this is the last slide I'll show you here. It's kind of hard to see. This plots the world's countries, the selection of the world's countries, along this axis, which is the UN human development indicator, the bottom axis, and this axis, which is uh, ecological footprint per person, per capita. So what we see is that for the most part, um, the, the countries with, with extremely high human development also have quite high ecological footprints. But it's not true for all countries. So what we have down here, in, in, in this box here, is high, is, very, is high and very high human development with very low uh, consumption, income, uh, and ecological footprint. Okay? So the goal, I think, is to figure out how to de-develop de um, our material economies to get back inside this box. Um, of high human development and sustainable ecological footprint. Uh, and I think that's the challenge of the, tw of the 21st century. And, um, and it, can it cannot be done with, with the conventional development uh, toolkit um, that relies heavily on GDP growth. So we have to invent new ways to think about this. Um, and I guess that's kind of where I'll leave it for, for now. Thank you.